When I first saw Andrew speaking, it was at a literary festival here in the UK, and I was immediately bowled over by the passion, the erudition, and the articulation of the poetry of Rumi, of which he's a, uh, one of the world's great specialists. And then I realised that he was also one of the youngest ever fellows of All Souls College in Oxford, which is an award only for the very, the brightest of the bright. And so it was thrilling for me when Andrew told me a bit about how he had built the notion of sacred activism and established this series at North Atlantic Books. And then I was even more thrilled when he invited me to contribute a book to that series. So it's been a joy and a pleasure to develop this with you, Andrew. The joy is entirely mine. And when I met you, I was so struck by the combination of deep inner radiance that you have and this amazing focus that has come from all the years of very determined activism that you have done. Your reputation preceded you. I knew that you founded the Oxford Research Group that did such important work on nuclear decision making. I knew that you founded Peace Direct, an organization I tremendously admire that does very extraordinary work to help people empower themselves in difficult situations and build peace in local communities. And I'd been told that you'd won the Nuano Peace Prize in 2003, a prize that's awarded for people who build peace from a spiritual foundation. All that is very grand, but the person that I met wasn't grand at all in that way. Very simple, very passionate, very clear. And I immediately knew that there was a tremendous vision in you that needed to come out. And that's why I'm so happy that I've had the chance to commission the book and to work with you on the book and to get to know you as a dear friend. Well, it's, it's been a great adventure. One of the things that drew me to you, Sarah, at the very beginning was that I recognised in you the same kind of person as I am myself, a bridge person somebody who bridges very different worlds and very different dimensions, the world of power and the world of spirit. And I wanted to ask you at the beginning of our exploration of your life, how you see yourself right now doing what you do? I think, or I feel that my job is to be a connector, a bridge, as you've said, between, if you like, the personal and the political between the psychological and the analytical, between those who work on the uh, developing the inner power with those who have enormous power in the outer world. So it's that, um, that quite subtle and difficult job of, if you like, translating between the two. Translating the world power to the world of the spirit. And and the, world, the, the personal to the world of the impersonal. And enabling people who work at the coalface of really difficult situations in areas of hot conflict, for example, to enable them to develop the inner strength to keep them going, to, to nourish their work, and to enable those who are working in any demanding situation, politicians included, to... Uh, develop self-awareness which will enable them to be far more conscious in the way they do things. And that, to me, is the absolute secret uh, of the way we tackle the challenges facing the planet now. So let's look now, Scylla, at how you became the person you are. Tell me, where were you born and what was your family like? What kind of background did you come from? Well, my family were farmers and I had four older brothers <laughs> who I was always trying to keep up with and when I was about 11 they put a shotgun in my hand and taught me to fire it. Uh, so I went out all alone up into the woods and I was feeling very uh, proud of myself, rather um, robust. One of the boys. One of the boys and I saw a nest 
high up in one of the trees and I went underneath the nest. This is something absolutely taboo. And I pointed my gun upwards and fired. Mm. And down on me rained pieces of embryo chick, pieces of shell, ticks and twigs and pieces of the mother bird who had been, was no longer a beautiful blue jay. And I was so shocked and so ashamed of what I'd done that I took the gun home and never touched it again. And I think it was that experience of, of the violence of which I was capable right. that set me off on, 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 on my direction. The next thing I remember was when I was 13 and sitting in the living room of my parents' home watching a grainy black and white TV and seeing these Soviet tanks rolling into Budapest. This was 1956. And children my age were throwing themselves at the tanks and the tanks were mowing them down. And I rushed upstairs and started packing my suitcase. And my mother came up and said, what on earth are you doing? And I said, I'm going to Budapest. I hadn't the faintest idea where Budapest was. And she said, why? Uh, and I said, there's something so horrible happening there that I have to go. And she said, don't be so silly. That was the way she was. And I burst into tears. And bless her, she got it. She got how important this was for me. And she said, I get it. You want to help. Uh, people in such tough situations but you're much too young you need training mm. and if you would just unpack your suitcase I will see that you get trained and she did and what happened then she actually enabled you to get to places where you would see the world naked and would learn how to react well she sent me off to work in a in a holiday home for people who'd been in refugee camps after the second world war um, and that was where I saw really the effects of the brutality of that war um, stamped on a man's face, a boot stamped on this man's face who'd been crushed in the snow in a concentration camp. And then I went to work in a, a camp for re refugees from the Vietnam War and then down to Algiers, which was, which was just emerging from the most vicious civil war to work, um, I, I set, up, set out to find work in an orphan for Algerian children who had been left destitute after the war. Um, and this was, um, it, it opened my eyes to the extent of what humans are capable of doing to humans. Was it very difficult to reconcile the life of a vibrant young woman and this passionate social concern that you had were there two different lives or could you mm. did you have friends that you could actually communicate your passion um to? i d it, it, i don't think it was difficult at all because when i was at university i was half the time protesting some human rights abuse on o'connell street and the in other dublin, in yes. dublin where where i was at university and the other half the time i was um um, walking up and down a catwalk as a model, um, <laughs> raising money, <laughs> and and so it didn't seem uh, a contradiction at all. But when I got to South Africa, because I was making my way all round the west coast of Africa, and nearly getting stuck in the war in the Congo, and when I got to South Africa, I realised that um, if I tried to apply my social science diploma there. I would be in jail in six months. I mean, there was no question. So I went completely the opposite direction and became um, a fashion retailer um, and introduced the Mary Quant range into South Africa. And I just lived a, a blinkered life. I, I closed my eyes to everything that was going on. I had a sports car and a posh flat and I lived a life of um, extraordinary privilege. So it was only when I met my husband, a wonderful, wonderful man, and got married and went back to university and learned to speak the local language, which was Zulu. Then I began to understand what was going on. 
But you didn't just understand it, and God knows how South Africa is an absolutely heartbreaking experience. You didn't just understand it, you responded, you joined an organization. Mm. Describe that organization. Well, I, I joined an organization called Kupugani, and that Kupugani in Zulu means pull yourself up by your bootstraps, so self-help. And what we were doing was tackling starvation in a country whose government adamantly uh, denied that there was any starvation. Right. And what we were seeing was um, milk, fresh milk, being poured down the mines in front of children with bellies extended from Koshoko. So it was inf enraging how callous the treatment of children particularly was. And so we set up an organisation to... Well, it was already set up when I joined, but we set up a depot to sell very low priced nutritious foods we we had the milk part the milk that was being poured down the mines made into milk powder and we sold that to mothers who couldn't afford branded milk powder uh, whose milk had run out um, we instituted very widespread education programs to enable people to use sometimes a small plot of land behind their home to grow vegetables, and so on. What did you learn from that experience? Because it's the first time that you really became hands-on. What mm. lessons did you learn? Oh, um, I, I learned the, sh the sheer raw courage of people who have nothing and who stand up for themselves. I mean, it, it, it moved me to my core that somebody who had nothing was prepared to stand up against a regime as huge and terrifying as the apartheid regime. And that was one of the reasons why we set up um, the market theatre. Now, as you may know, in South Africa in those days, this was 1974, 75, it was illegal for blacks and whites to be on the stage or in the audience together. But one night, a group of actors, multiracial, came to our door, banged on the door late at night and said, you have to come down to the market in Johannesburg, it's on sale. Why is this exciting? Because it has a permit under the Group Areas Act for blacks and whites to be there together because it's a market. And if we could buy it and convert it into a theatre fast before anybody catches up with us. So we, <laughs> so we did. My husband and I went down there the next day, fell in love with it and raised the money at, I mean, I I blackmailed every person I sat next to at a dinner party into giving me money for it. And in six months, we had the place converted, uh, paid for, and opened. And the night we opened, we thought that everybody in the theatre might get arrested because it was blatantly illegal what we were doing, um, black, black and white people everywhere together. But it, we didn't get arrested, and the market theatre began to send its fantastic productions to the National Theatre in London. My God. And ironically became the greatest advertisement for creative art in South Africa. It's true to say, though, that this work that you plunged into started to create tensions in your marriage. Yeah. Because your husband was, although fairly enlightened, mm. an employer and a white and living in that world and you were branching out into this new world of activism mm. so you decided to leave south africa didn't you and mm. go to paris mm. but that didn't stop you plunging into new forms of activism did it well my husband saw a, uh, an advertisement in the paper saying that the minority rights group needed an, uh, somebody to help them develop there and so i applied and the next thing i knew i was asked to do a report on what was then called female genital mutilation. Oh. And nobody had written a report on it. This was the first report ever, really. Yeah. The first report to make available the full horror of what is done still to 100 million women all over the world. Exactly. So I teamed up with six African and Arab women to help write it so that it really came from their experience. And, I mean, I was... My whole being was shattered learning the extent of what those operations, often done with a, a rusty can lid or a piece of glass, uh, on women's genitals. I mean, 
impossible to describe. And um, the report that we wrote eventually led to the World Health Organization banning the practice, which it hadn't then. But it didn't outlaw, I mean, a law was passed against the practice in this country, in the UK, but nobody has ever yet been prosecuted under that law. I know you're a little silly now, and I can only imagine the horror that you felt as a Western woman when you understood the full depth of this degradation that was being visited mm -hmm. upon women. Was this the moment that your understanding of the oppression and despoliation of women's rights began, the understanding that grew into your great book, your great first book, the first book that I've read of yours, Power and Sex. Mm. Did it begin there or had you already come to understand that our world was is marked by a very great degradation of the feminine? Well, I think when this really happened was when UNESCO asked me to write um, a... a their contribution to the second UN World Women's Conference. And UNESCO wanted me to write about women's role in peace research and the improvement of relations between nations, some long title like that. I knew nothing about any of that, so I went off to find out. And then I met women who really opened my eyes. Um, Elise Boulding, the mother, a grandmother of peace research, in the United States, Betty Reard and other great women. And they really opened my eyes to this whole question, not only of women's role, but of the fact that, of the uh, enormous danger that the entire world was in from nuclear weapons at that time. And that's what began your passion about nuclear disarmament and about finding mm -hmm. a way to make disarmament possible and real? Well, yes, because I was in New York at the time of the UN Second Special Session on Disarmament. And after it had been got going on for a week with no results, uh, a, a crowd of a million people assembled in New York. I remember that. I was actually there. You were yes, there? Yes. We could have bumped into each other yes. then. <laughs> yes. um, and uh, at the end of the day, which was totally peaceful, the police were leaning back against the brownstones around Central Park with peace badges down their ties. And so everything was just... And the New York Times gave it five double pages next day, and I thought, this is it. And it I... was one of the most important demonstrations in the history of demonstrations. Absolutely. Yes. And I rushed into the UN, and expecting everything to have changed. Not one country changed its position one centimetre. So that I, must have been devastating for you. I was, I was distraught. I, and I was strap hanging on a tram on Broadway on my way home that night, in, in really in despair. And suddenly I had one of those flashes that you can't explain, they just happen. And I thought, we're talking to the wrong, or we're shouting at the wrong people. Right. Because clearly those people in the UN can't do anything. Who are the people who make decisions on nuclear weapons? Who, who, who designs them? Who, who makes money out of them? Who deploys them? Who's the strategist? And I thought, if we could find out who those people are, and then instead of shouting at them, go and talk to them from an informed perspective, then something might change. So That was a very profound realisation. On the one hand, to realise that what looks like power is actually the, the puppets of secret forms of power which the world doesn't know about unless you make an enormous effort to find out. Mm -hmm. And secondly, that a wholly new methodology of encounter needed to be worked out. Exactly, exactly that. So I stopped what I was doing in New York, came home and started a research group round my kitchen table <laughs> and I still have that table right here in this very living room because all the best initiatives local initiatives start round someone's kitchen table so in 1982 around my kitchen table we set up what became the Oxford research group and its mandate was to find out how the decision making process worked not only in the UK but also in France, America, 
Russia, which was then the Soviet Union, and China. And China. Yes. Now, everybody said that's impossible, so we said, well, let's start with China, if that's the <laughs> most difficult. Yes. And to my astonishment, and this is to cut a very long story short, we managed within four years to produce our first book, which was simply called How Nuclear Weapons Decisions Are Made. We then took up the second part of the challenge, which was to engage local groups, people who were Quaker groups, women's groups, youth groups, and so on, who were concerned about nuclear weapons, to adopt one nuclear weapons policy maker from their own country and one from China. This meant they had to do a lot of homework, and they also had to work on their own emotions of outrage, fear, and so forth, because there's no point going to try and open a dialogue with somebody in a, in a responsible position unless you're able to do it without pointing finger and being on the moral high ground. That was essential. That was an essential part of the whole thing. So each group had a folder with the details of their decision maker on one side and their training in developing their own inner power on the other side. And that's when this combination started. Within um, a few years, we'd got such a big research database that we were able to publish a book called The Nuclear Weapons World, which was in fact a who's who, including 650 biographies of those responsible for nuclear weapons in all the nuclear countries. My God. The idea being to make the process accountable. That was our... We, we, had, we never touched any classified material. We didn't want any spy scandals. That wasn't it. We wanted to make this decision-making, which was affecting the entire world and putting us all in danger, to be accountable. But for publishing this book, we got banned. It was, it was too much for the Ministry of Defence in this country. And that made our job considerably more difficult. Uh, I would like to then move on to how we did actually gain the trust of key decision-makers. Uh, I set out to interview senior military men, senior nuclear physicists designing nuclear warheads, and each of them I interviewed in great depth and then played back their thinking to them. So we got into a, a deep dialogue, mm. and that gave them some trust in me. And that then enabled them to feel just safe enough to come to some two or three day long meetings at a Quaker manor house outside Oxford. And we brought them together with their opposite numbers from other countries, but also with informed critics, those who knew enough about what the whole process was to be able to open a proper dialogue and ultimately form the basis for the, for the development of treaties. But getting people to actually take off their masks, their personas, their all the constituency on their shoulders was very delicate. And we realized we had to create a safe environment. And underneath the room where we all met in this Quaker manor house was a library. And I invited five great and seasoned meditators to come there, including my great mentor, Adam Carl, to meditate all day while the meeting was taking place above. And one sign of this emerging was when a, a man from the US State Department took me aside on the second day of a meeting. And he said, Salad, this is a very special room. And I said, yes, it was, <laughs> it was built in 1360. Yeah. And he said, no, 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 it's very special. And I said, well, people have been doing yoga in this room and talking as Quakers do. And he said, no, there's something coming up through the floorboards. <laughs> And I said, well, yes, you're right. Do you want to know what it is? And he said, yeah. So I told him, and he looked as though I'd slapped him. And I said, well, those older people who serve you your lunch, please go and ask them. It's them. Mm. And so one could see that this meditation support for what we were doing was having a profound effect and indeed led to the most extraordinary of 
meetings between people who utterly disagreed with it, with one another. And this, of course, did have an impact on nuclear policy. And you were nominated with the group for the Nobel Prize. Mm. Wonderful. But this led you to also expand your work. You founded Peace Direct mm. in 2002. Mm. Tell us a little about Peace Direct. Well, by that time, I'd got to know that there were ordinary people at the coalface of conflict, at the sharp end, doing extraordinarily brave work. But nobody was supporting them. Yeah, so yeah. we did a survey, and we found that there were 350 such initiatives. And we wrote up 50 of them in a book called War Prevention Works. And then we set up Peace Direct to identify those who were doing reliable work to put uh, a small amounts of funds behind them, but most particularly to get the media coverage so they were safer. Because if you're known to be doing this work, you're actually safer. And that work has now developed and developed and is still continuing, as is the Oxford Research Group. And another thing that you've been involved in in these last years is the elders. Hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the idea was Peter Gabriel's and Richard Branson's, to, in order, since the world is now a global village, that the global village needs global elders to, to, make, to help the world make wiser decisions. They took the idea to uh, Nelson Mandela, who said, go away and make it work. And at that point, I was invited to, to help. With a very good team, we designed who the elders should be, what they might do, and um, presented Mandela with 300 biographies of potential elders from whom he chose the final 12, which included great people like Kofi Annan, former UN Secretary General, uh, Jimmy Carter. Desmond. Gras <laughs> well, I'll come to Desmond in a moment. Grasa Michelle, uh, Mandela's wife, Mary Robinson, the great human rights supremo, oh, yes. and shared by Desmond Tutu. Hooray. Mm. In a, in a, with his ineffable fun and seriousness combined. We're drawing to the close, Sil, and I'd love to ask you a question that I've want wanted to ask you for a long time. What is your inner life? What is your deep belief at this moment? You talk about the necessity of the unity between deep spirituality and wise radical action. Where does your spiritual inspiration come from? Well, I think it, it, all these things take discipline, and I learned to meditate through the Quakers, actually. I became a Quaker and learned the value of silence and silent reflection. And that led me through various different practices and traditions until one day a, a, a poster fell out of my cupboard, and it was the picture of Kuan Yin. Uh, and I didn't know who she was, I didn't, but she was this beautiful white figure riding a bright red dragon. And I was mesmerized by this image of the combination of the, the deep feminine with the power of the dragon, the deep masculine. Um, and ever since then, this image, which comes originally from China, she's the goddess of compassion, has stayed with me and guided me. And to me, it's the great... Um, source of strength and power for the future. Well, the source of strength and power for the future is this marriage between the values and powers of the deep feminine of nourishing and protecting and interconnectedness and generosity with the capacity that the deep masculine has for order and law and clarity. And bringing them together is the source of a new energy and a new possibility. And Scylla, I can say to you with all my heart that in you I see somebody who, through so much and many ordeals and many triumphs, have brought them together to, to model what that looks like for all of us. Thank you so much. That's exactly what you do.